the show of Meet the Author. We're delighted to have with us today Jan Cardis, creator and chairman of the Unicorn Writers Conference. You can find it right now at unicornwritersconference.com. That's U-N-I-C-O-R-N, writers, W-R-I-T-E-R-S-C-O-N-F-E-R-E-N-C-E.com. That's one word. This is an annual event here in Connecticut at the gorgeous St. Clement's Castle in Portland. This latest conference took place just this past April, and the next one is due in March of 2013. Many writers and agents are looking forward to it. It's in the planning stages right now. Under the stewardship and experience guidance of Jan Cardis, and with the goal of helping all those who attend achieve their dreams of getting published, the Unicorn Writers Conference has been popular and successful every year and has drawn rave reviews from agents, writers, and attendees alike. How are you, Jan? Fine. Well, let's see. What is the role of the Writers Conference and why should writers attend? Um, writers should attend um, to make contacts with literary agents and, and book editors, and it's a great networking opportunity for them. Generally, um, they're not able to have contact, personal contact, with literary agents. Their only contact is through sending a query letter, um, and this is direct one-to-one -one experience for them. Um, for example, at my conference, I had um, query letter workshops and one-to-one -one sessions with an agent. Uh -huh. Can you show us? Here's a picture of the conference catalog, and here's a very nice picture of the conference itself. Can you maybe go through a little bit of what was in the conference? Oh, we can read straight off. Yes. Um, well, I had five different workshops going on every hour. I had wow. two agent panels. I had 21 literary agents. Can um, you name us a few? Well, yes, I can. Um, Catherine Sands, John Ware. Um, I had... Pick um, one and what did they do? Well, Catherine Sands um, actually has written a book um, uh, called The Perfect Pitch. And she did a workshop to teach authors, basically, how do you pitch to an agent? How do you pick, pitch your book to a book publisher? It's an art form, writing a query letter, Selling yourself to a publisher is something you have to study before you just go out there. And to have this opportunity at a conference. And one of the things you told me before the show is that you actually put um, a lot of the workshops on a DVD. Yes. Can you tell us a little about that? Um, tell us? Yes. Well, what I did was I put um, every guest speaker, every workshop, uh, including two agent panels, um, and an editor panel, I had uh, a film company come in and actually film it and burn it so it was immediately for sale. Because with five different workshops going on every hour, um, writers t couldn't take everything they wanted to take. And I wanted them to have the benefit of learning as much as possible in one day for a very reasonable price. I charged, uh, I actually beat my competition. So I, it's one of my gifts. Well, back to authors. Now that you mentioned price, I would expect a successful conference is not, is an expensive proposition. Are you looking for sponsors for the Unif uh, Unicorn Writing Conference? Are you planning fundraisers to help you put on yet another very successful conference? Yes, in fact, I am. Can you talk um, about that a little bit? Well, I'm in the process of setting up a fundraising event in Reading, Connecticut, um, where I live. Uh, with a Mark Twain impersonator at the Mark Twain Reading Roadhouse and possibly the Mark Twain Library. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll be doing dances and other functions in order to bring in best-selling authors. I had, for example, this year in April, I had Sandra Brown, who's a major best-selling author, and Patricia Schultz. How can people find out about the conference and where do you advertise, where do you tell? Is it just at the website or the uh, other well, what I, One of the things I do is I take this postcard and, show that up like that. Um, and I mailed out about 50 copies to every library in 10 states. Actually, now that you mention it, I did see that in our library in Wethersfield. So yes. someone should keep their eyes open yes. for, and here they do have a picture of a unicorn in case you don't remember, that's the Unicorn Conference. 
So you do have a picture of a unicorn over here. Right. And you'll know right away. And it says Unicorn Conference. Right. Um, and, and it takes place at St. Clement's Castle in Portland, Connecticut. And it's a 12,000 square foot castle. It's absolutely gorgeous. And I wanted sort of a dreamy, ethereal place for writers. And so that's why I chose that location. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into this. You were once an agent, you worked with Google. Tell us well, about I've that. worked actually in publishing, book publishing, for over 35 years and started out in editorial. Worked in art and production, subsidiary rights, and I was a director of contracts. But I've worked for all the major publishers, Doubleday, Macmillan, Simon & Schuster, uh, Prentice Hall, Warner Books, and Little Brown. Um, Condé Nast for a year, and also Google, and Scholastic twice. So, so you definitely, I've, I've uh, done a lot. Gathered a lot of experience yeah, to have this of sort of conference. Yes. So since you, um, I'm sure our viewers would love to know even a few juicy because this is a television show. We want to get the juicy stuff. A few juicy inside stories of the very famous authors you met and worked with. If you can just tell well, us Well, there's some. so many of them. I don't know where to start. Well, start um, with, you know, one of my favorites. Uh, well, start with Ivana Trump. I have a uh, reason well, why I'm asking Ivana that. Ivana Trump was a really interesting story. Um, at the time, I was married to Robert Gottlieb, who's mm -hmm. a very famous literary agent in New York. And he was running the William Morris Literary Department at the time. Mm -hmm. And we had just seen on the news Ivana Trump's getting divorced and there was the whole Mar Marla Maples situation. Mm -hmm. She knew she was going to get divorced. Every agent in New York City wanted her mm. to write a book. So Robert had, you know, my ex-husband um, said to one of the agents at William Morris, you know the dressmaker for Ivana Trump, don't you? Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll split the commission mm -hmm. if you take this letter to Ivana Trump. Mm -hmm. So three days later, he had a meeting with Ivana Trump, and he said, Ivana, mm -hmm. you're going to be getting divorced. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you love to write the real story about Donald? But you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to come up with some other idea. Well, I have the best idea for you. Let's write fiction. Mm -hmm. And she loved that idea. She signed him up as her agent. And I met her a few times in mar Largo and in, in her Greenwich home, and she was just such a really lovely woman, you know. Mm -hmm. The media paints a different picture of her, but she was absolutely, you know, no, lovely. No, I think later on it came out how uh, good she is, and yeah. uh, she was pretty famous yeah. for that. And then I met Tom Clancy. Uh -huh. um, What's up? What are, uh, Tom Clancy is pretty famous. What are some of the books that Tom Clancy Well, wrote? Hunt for Red October, right. he wrote that, and um, actually it's an interesting story yeah, um, he how good. he was discovered. He had never written an article at all or a book or anything. Mm -hmm. um, he was really interested in the military. He could never get in the military. But he drew, he decided to write The Hunt for Red October. Mm -hmm. With and, uh, James Bond, Sean Connery, of yes, course. Yes, of course. And he didn't have an agent. He sent it to the Naval Institute Press. Mm -hmm. And they bought the book. And Robert, my former husband, found the galley at an event called Book Expo. It's sort of like a car show, but for books. Mm -hmm. And he said, here, I'm at William Morris, and I'm, I'm recruiting for motion pictures, which mm -hmm. actually wasn't true. He was, he was a literary agent. Mm -hmm. But he convinced the Naval Institute Press to let him borrow the book overnight. Mm -hmm. And he came back and said, you know what? Make these changes. You have a bestseller on your hand. Really? That's and fantastic. And Tom... He tried to get Tom as a client, and Tom, you know, said, what do I need you for? I already have a book publisher. <laughs> and Robert, being very tenacious, decided, you know what? Naval Institute Press, you should sell this book to a paperback house. You don't have experience. I do. And they hired him, and Putnam Berkeley bought it. And there was a potential lawsuit, and that's when Tom finally realized, I need a literary agent. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you can get published without a literary agent if you have a contact or a friend. Mm -hmm. um, but agents really protect authors' interests, not just in contracts, but in a host of other things that they need to know about. And now that you mentioned that, tell us a little about um, the story of Tony Curtis, where he was re one of his manuscripts oh, yes. rejected and he wanted... Uh, to uh, find out why his manuscript was rejected. Oh, yes. And the reason I mention it is because 
some you hear a lot that when an author is looking for you know to write a query letter or looking to find an agent they always hear about the rejections the 30 rejections right. they have to go through let's hear a little bit about that one about the tony curtis well yes. um i was working at doubleday at the time and part of my job was going after authors who don't deliver a manuscript mm -hmm. or they deliver what's called an unsatisfactory manuscript mm -hmm. and what the public and writers don't know is it's really solely at the author's sole discretion what's going to be accepted and what isn't. Mm -hmm. But Tony Curtis had already published a best-selling book with right. Doubleday right. and his second book got rejected. Mm -hmm. But he was Tony Curtis, he was famous, mm -hmm. he was hot. Doesn't he didn't take rejection I guess. He didn't take rejection well and the Editor, who I won't mention his name. What year about were we talking about when you were oh, in way the back, I think it's, I don't know. I, I don't you really remember the year. an actor? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, they, they rejected his book, and he sued. Mm -hmm. He sued Doubleday. And because he was able to prove that they didn't really give him a chance to fix his manuscript, um, all major literary agents ask for a clause in publishing agreements that's called duty to edit. In other words, if your manuscript is sold to, you know, St. Martin's Press or Warner Books or Little Brown, uh, your agent should ask for detailed reasons why your book is being rejected, and you should have a cure period in which to fix the fix your book and your manuscript. And he wasn't given that opportunity. He wasn't given that opportunity. So it actually changed publishing. Mm -hmm. You know, before publishers were arrogant, mm -hmm. and now you know authors can't be really pushed around as much. They have to be accountable. Yes. Okay, and. Um that's good. But you can't force the publisher to publish your book if they decide no. not to. But they just have to give you a reason. They have why to give you a reason. It could be marketing reasons, mm -hmm. or it could be it's truly not a satisfactory book. Mm -hmm. And you also said that you uh, had some experience with Nicholas Sparks, one of my um, favorite authors. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. Um, I worked at Warner Books, which is now called Grand Central Publishing, who mm -hmm. still publishes Nicholas Sparks books and. I, I was there for four years. I negotiated all of his publishing agreements mm -hmm. um, with his agent, um, and he's just you. You uh, I, negotiated with Sparks' publishing agreements. Yes, really? with, with his literary wow. agent. So um, that Can was. I ask which books well, at the time. He well, I think it was. I book? think it was the Notebook, so that's uh, the first started. book, and some of his other books after that. Message in a Bottle. I can't really? remember all the titles, wow. but. Um, it was fun. It was an interesting experience. So as director of contracts for many major publishers, your role was negotiating publishing agreements with major literary agents and attorneys on behalf of the publisher. What advice would you give the writers in, your, in our audience regarding the negotiation of contracts? And give us, if you would, some of your more interesting recollections regarding contract negotiations, some additional ones. Right. Well, I mean, there's so many. Um, I think the most important thing for writers who are mm -hmm. going to be published for the first time is read the publishing agreement first. Mm -hmm. Don't let your agent just go ahead and, and go through point by point. Actually read it and ask questions. What does... Well, what's the difference between going through it point, point, point and reading it? Well, you need to understand what is, for example, the out of print clause. A literary agent's not going to fight for you on mm -hmm. that clause. Because once your book is out of print, they really don't care about you. They're on to the next so author. So they should have a lawyer in addition to a literary well, agent? Well, um, they could have a lawyer, but actually I, I, I've negotiated for, with so many best-selling authors. The most difficult contract I ever negotiated was with an author who had no agent who mm -hmm. called me up and said, Jan, I have no idea you know, what I should ask for in this publishing agreement. And I said, well, if I told you I would get fired, mm -hmm. I have to protect the publisher's interests, not yours. Go home, go back to your hotel room, read the entire contract, and then come in and ask me questions. Mm -hmm. Well, this woman was tenacious. She said, what does this clause mean? What if my book goes out of print? What happens to the remaining copies? Can I buy them at a lower price? Mm -hmm. I mean, she thought of everything. Mm -hmm. She had no experience. She didn't read publishing books. She was actually better than some of the, the toughest 
New York City publishing attorneys I've dealt with because it was her book. She cared very much about it. Mm -hmm. um, first time authors are reluctant to fight. They're so excited and delighted that they that have they've their. Been discovered. That right. they've been discovered. This is their first deal. They'll mm -hmm. just sign on the dotted line. And mm -hmm. I've seen that happen over and over and over mm -hmm. again. And we've also heard famous actors that were cheated out of contracts that became famous and they didn't ask for a percentage. Yes. That's one of the things yeah. I know that when you make a movie, you should always ask for at least a percent, even if it's yes. one percent, that if the movie really grows right. a lot, you should get one percent at well, least. Well, if probably you, sh more, but you shouldn't give motion picture rights or TV rights or commercial rights to a book publisher. Mm -hmm. They're just not really equipped mm -hmm. to handle those rights. And if you have an inexperienced agent, a uh, literary agent who doesn't know that, you know, you can get screwed. So those rights should a, be reserved. Okay, so that brings up a good um, question. What book should somebody read or what source, resource, should someone be familiar with uh, before they seek an agent or a contract? What can they, where can they well, do? Well, I mean, actually the best um, way to go about learning about this is to attend writers' conferences. I mean, I teach a class, the, the last know. class is on mm -hmm. contracts. I mean, there are books on publishing law that you can find. I have on my website, jamcartis.com, I have a list of titles of books you could buy. Well, not or because that's interesting you mentioned that because not every conference has the part about contract law, right. and that's an important thing right. to know. So that's, I'm happy to hear that, yeah. that you have that. Yeah, I have conference. that workshop. And then I also do, um, uh, I do these library events all over Connecticut and mm -hmm. New England on, mm -hmm. you wrote a book, Now What? 65-page PowerPoint with details about contracts. You know, mm -hmm. these are... Uh, I actually saw your name on, on Meetup once. Do you still advertise on Meetup? Yes, okay. yes, I have a Meetup group. Do you want to tell people um, which Meetup group that is? Um, well, it's a book publishing Meetup group, and it's based in Reading and Bethel. And I, I do it like every other month, and authors come from all over. Um, but the library events are probably the best mm -hmm. for authors to attend that I, I give. I just did one recently in Baldwin, New York. Mm -hmm. And I go through a PowerPoint, and then I give them practical information about, you know, should you self-publish your book, mm -hmm. or should you go to a traditional publisher? Mm -hmm. It's not a negative at mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. to be self-published today. I'm self-published. Uh, it's, you know, you know what? what you're talking about. It's, um, it's actually the smartest way to go, and I'll tell you why. Why? Because you have complete control over your book. Mm -hmm. you, you need to find a, 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 a great artist to do a great cover. You need to have your book edited. It should be in the best shape possible. But you you can prove to a publisher how good you are with how you market your book. Right. And let's say you have no money. You have no money to market. Mm -hmm. You can do some amazing things mm -hmm. over the internet, just using Facebook and Twitter, um, Google, for example. I don't know if you know this. I worked at Google for three years. There's a page on Google. Well, how would I know this? Well, <laughs> there's a page on Google that oh, I know. Um, at, when you go into a Gmail account, right. Google's email account, Gmail, right at the top, there's a little button that says more. Yes. You click that button on, and there's another button that says even more. And it's all of Google's products. Correct. And there's so many free things that authors could use. Mm -hmm. Cross-marketing. Mm -hmm. with other authors. Let's say you did a vegetarian cookbook mm -hmm. and then you found another person who does, you know, vegetarian Mexican cookbook. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you contact each other and you'll say, show my cover on your website and I'll show your cover yeah, on my website. Cross-linking. Cross yeah, cross-marketing. Cross reviewing actually. Yeah. Um, once you publish, uh, other authors in the same genre will approach you and say, will you please read, you know, review my book and yes. I'll review your book. Um, that has happened. That's Reviews so are important, but, you know, mm -hmm. do, be innovative. I'll, I'll give you an interesting story of, um, I attended a writer's conference a few years ago with, as a guest speaker, mm -hmm. and one of the workshops I went to was about how powerful the internet is. This mm -hmm. one woman sent out her manuscript, it was her memoir. 200 literary agents rejected her. Mm -hmm. She had no money to self-publish, but what did she do to get three agents and a really great advance. LinkedIn. How did she get there? What she did was LinkedIn. brilliant. What? Not LinkedIn. She put together a blog. She found some old recipes, Family Circle, Women's Day, 
Weight Watchers, mm -hmm. and she put the recipes on, up on her website. You can't copyright a recipe. She took some pictures. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty blog. These were, these, were, these were recipes she found <clears throat> in these magazines, very old magazines. Mm -hmm. There was she, no copyright. No, there was no, no copyright issue. Okay. She credited them. But what she did was brilliant. She wrote to 25 of her girlfriends, and she said, listen, I found the original mac and cheese recipe with a crust on top. Okay. You have to go look at it. It's on my blog. I just created it. All her girlfriends went, mm -hmm. but she slipped in her first chapter of her book, and everyone read it. The and book she, was on cooking. It, no, the book was, was her story. It was a memoir. Oh, her own memoir. It okay. was her book. Oh, okay. And she couldn't sell this book. No right. agent wanted it. Right. Um, what was the ironic thing is, it was a really great book. She was a she was a good writer. She was very smart. Twenty five of her girlfriends who all wrote on her blog, unsolicited. She didn't tell them she was doing this. Really? They all wrote how much they loved her first chapter, and it inspired her. She said, "Could you do me a favor? Take twenty five of your girlfriends, each of her girlfriends, and let them know." And I'm going to put up chapter two. And then she spent two years. That's, it was women helping women. Mm -hmm. She got over a million women. Interested, just on the blog. On the blog. She put the entire book on the blog. Wow. Then she went out again after two years to all the major literary agents. I said, look how many people, look at how many people love my book. Yeah. And you know what that proves to an agent? She can write. She knows how to market. Mm -hmm. And she was brought to the Writers Conference because she was a success story. And did she publish that book, or she published no, she, another one? No, it was that book. Obviously, the publisher edited it and mm -hmm. made changes. They put it out as well. But it was a major publisher. Um, yeah. She got a nice advance, and it's you know it's wow. a Cinderella story. So I, I love nice. it when those things happen. And also, I know that when people are interactive on your blog, and it's a trick for everybody. It increases your Google placement. Yes. If you visit but you don't leave a message, um, that doesn't increase the placement as much as if you go to a blog and you make a comment, right. then that increases the placement. So right. if you have friends, uh, definitely go and help them out and do that. Right. Um, what, do publish, what do book publishers not want an author to know? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a big question. We're not against very big. By the way. No, we're not, because I've worked for all of them. Um, well, there's certain contract clauses they don't want you to know. They don't want you to know What's the what, big one? The what, big one. The big well, one. I mean, there's so many of them. Um, the big one. They don't want you to know um, various, what every department does. In, in in a publishing con in a publishing house like why not there's well there's the subsidiary rights department special sales marketing art department production mm -hmm. contracts royalties there's certain departments that are key for an author's success mm -hmm. and if you're with a large publishing house like Simon and Schuster or Random House yeah that's great that you have a contract with them and they're going to publish your book but now you're in competition with all their other best selling authors. Mm -hmm. You need to stand out. Um, how, are you, how are you going to get the subsidiary rights department, which is the department that will sell your book to a book club or to a foreign publisher, if you just have your first little novel? Mm -hmm. You're not top priority for them. Mm -hmm. And with the economy, publishers are not expanding departments, they're cutting back. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from doing sales myself, at various publishing houses, I did not have time to send every book out to all the magazines I wanted it to go to or to all the foreign agents for every book. Yeah, but what is, so how, what is so the what point where they don't want, do? no, but what is the point they didn't want you to Well, they don't want you to know, part. they don't want you to know the details of what they do and what they don't do. Oh, okay. But if you're informed. You can't follow up. No, you should be, you should, you know, as soon as you, you get your book, you know it's going to be published in a few months, obviously after your publishing agreement is signed. Find out who's the director of the subsidiary rights department. So send them flowers. Mm -hmm. Send them a thank you. Right. Show them who you are. Bottom um, line, it's people. Excuse me? It's people who help people. Oh, yes, the yes. Line. And special mm -hmm. sales, the art department. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to choose the cover for your book. They're not going to, you know, give you cover approval. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they work so hard. They have so much pressure on them. They have to have some 
knowledge of the internal makings of the business of publishing yes. if you're going to be an author. Yes. Just like if you're going to be an actor, you should also know a little bit about directing. And uh, a lot of good actors also know about directing and producing, too, Right. to be a good actor. What mistakes do authors make in their publishing career? Uh, well, there's a lot of them. Um, I'm sure I, I, I've seen this happen over and over again. Um, authors don't realize um, that they have to market their book today. It's not like the olden days. Um, because of the internet, um, there's so many amazing things you can do. Um, you, you have to market. You have to promote yourself. You have to go out do library events, do conferences, get yourself on the radio, do as many things as possible. Network with other writers so that you can help each other. If you sit back and think your publisher is going to promote you, nothing will happen. Okay. Your book will die very quickly. Well, on that note, so I hope people will come. We're finishing up, so on that note, I hope people will come to your conference, and it'll be a place for people to... Um, learn how to be all about the, the book business and learn how to get published you know that'll be fantastic so it's okay. called the Unicorn Writers Conference we'll show our people before we close here's the good and it was my pleasure to have you here thank, thank you. you thank you Jason <sighs> <laughs> there what? Go. there it is